a major economy in peril. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. In our lead story today, the nightmare continues as this major economy continues to crash. Now, if you're wondering what we're doing inside this Chinese factory, well, I wanted to go firsthand to find out if it's as bad as the data is now suggesting. And in fact, it's far worse. And what I want you to understand, the takeaway from today's show is why we're next, because what's happening in China, well, it's coming to the U.S. Let's over to Bloomberg, where he picked today's story up with a headline. Contraction in China factory activity extends into a fourth month. And actually, this is from CNBC, not Bloomberg. As China's factory activity contracted for a fourth consecutive month in July, why non-manufacturing activity slowed to get this. It's weakest in a year as the world's second largest economy struggles to revive growth momentum in the wake of soft global demand. Now, what's important here to understand as we begin the story today is that everyone has been making the claim that the services sector around the world is going to lead the manufacturing sector because during the pandemic people were at home they had all that influx of money and they bought goods now they want to go out and have experiences get services and do all of that side of the economy and so what's supposed to happen what we need to see and this in china too is the services sector leading the the manufacturing sector out but that's normally not how it goes and it's not looking good for China either as the official manufacturing purchasers ma purchasing managers index came in at 49.3 in July compared with 49 in June and 48.8 in May and 49.2 in April now if you're not familiar with how to read these PMIs when you get a number of 50 it means it's unchanged so we gauge the factory sector and says look it's about where it was last our last month and the month before what we're seeing is just very slight contractions that's that number under 50 suggesting that what we're seeing in the Chinese manufacturing sector is literally it's just spinning its wheels it's going nowhere and that's not what should be happening if we're seeing global demand increase what we should see is China's factories ramp up and Monday's figures also show China posting its weakest, get this, weakest official non-manufacturing or services PMI reading this year, coming in at 51.5 in July, compared with 53.2 in June, 54.5 in May, and 56.4 in April. So this does denote an expansion because it's over 50, but what I want you to see is momentum is slowing. So as those numbers drop closer and closer to 50, it's kind of like taking your foot off the accelerator you're still moving forward but the rate of that speed is slowing down slowing down and slowing down so as we look to china we're saying wait a minute the manufacturing sector is going nowhere and the services sector is slowing down telling us there's problems Although China's manufacturing and PMI rebounded to 49.3% this month, some enterprises in the survey reported that the current external environment is complicated and severe. Now, this is not just words you would normally want to use when talking about the global economy. If I check this out, overseas orders have decreased and insufficient demand is still the main difficulty facing enterprises. So again, as we start to look at the bigger picture here, and why is this coming to America? It's real simple, because where does Chinese demand come from? Well, it comes from the world's largest importer. That would be America. It comes out of Europe, comes out of other countries. So if they're saying, look, demand is going down, that's why our factories aren't running really good. Well, what does it tell you about the U.S. economy? Well, it means it's slowing. Those readings for July point to a torturous economic recovery that China's top leaders described last Monday, which the political borough attributed to insufficient domestic demand, difficulties in the operation of some enterprises, and many risks and hidden dangers in key areas, not to mention a grim and complex external environment. So we've been looking for here in the U.S., China, to pull the world up and out of the slump that we're at least heading into. Maybe you remember back to 2015, 2016, this was the same story. The global economy was slowing and China stimulated and pulled the global economy up with it. And now what are we hearing from the political borough in China is, hey, wait a minute, even our own internal demand is weak and that doesn't bode well. 
Employment sub-indices for both manufacturing and non-manufacturing sectors declined in July, suggesting what we'll likely to see, and we'll get to some charts here in a bit, that even unemployment rate should be going up, and that points to lingering softness as youth unemployment hits successive record highs in China, and that's not a good thing. The service industry, a major sector that hires younger workers, the sub-index slowed to 1.3 percentage points in July from the previous month. But more worryingly, business expectation among the non-manufacturing sectors declined from the previous month, again validating that we're seeing a slowdown in the Chinese economy on both sides. Similar production and business activity expectations. So this is looking forward. Index for manufacturing, though, saw an increase of 1.7 percentage points from the previous month, suggesting that there's hope in the in the Chinese manufacturing sector that perhaps things are going to get better. But what is the real risk here? So you say, all right, so we're seeing a slowdown in the manufacturing and services sector there. Does it actually mean things there could be getting dire? Well, yes, they can. While everyone else fights inflation, this is from the Wall Street Journal, China deflation fears Deepen. And this is a big problem. Check this out. While the rest of the world tussles with inflation, China's at risk of experiencing a prolonged spell of falling prices. That if it takes root, and this is something that nobody in a debt-based economy wants, at least not if you're a policymaker, could eat into corporate profits, sap consumer spending, and push more people out of work. And we're going to validate each of these using U.S. data. Its effects will ripple across the globe, easing prices for some products that countries like the U.S. buy from China, but would also deprive the world of important Chinese demand for raw materials and consumer goods, while also creating other problems here. So what you're hearing from this is saying, look, China exports deflation. If their prices are going down, they're going to push that to the rest of the world. And then their demand for things like crude oil, well, that could drop and that would have an impact on a lot of other economies. So you can see if China hits deflation here, it's just serious repercussions for the rest of the world. And let's compare some of those. One thing it mentioned that deflation is bad for corporate profits. So let's start out using U.S. data because I don't have Chinese data available on this. But let's just see if it holds true. And looking at the consumer price index, that's in blue. And we've got corporate profits. And we're going to keep corporate profits on as billions of dollars, whereas the consumer price index, we're going to run that on a year-over-year -year rate of change. So let's take a look. During the dot-com bubble, we saw disinflation, corporate profits flattened out. Here you can see during the global financial crisis, we see deflation, corporate profits came crumbling down. Here in 2015, 2016, we saw a bout of disinflation almost into the deflationary zone. What happened? Corporate profits down. You see it happening during the pandemic. And you're starting to see it now, which is, what, of course, what investors are hoping for is the Goldilocks scenario that the Fed's been telling us is is going to happen that they're going to bring inflation down wages are going to stay up demand is going to be there and don't worry everything's okay but if we do continue to see disinflation and outright deflation well it tells us that corporate profits are coming down and that investors are on the wrong side of this trade Let's take a look at retail sales as we look at consumer demand. We see the same effects. The consumer price index, as you see disinflation, you see a slowdown in retail sales. You see that again here in the dot-com bubble. We see again retail sales were slowing well into going into the recession. We can see that, of course, during the global financial crisis. Here again during 2015 into 2016. We see around late 2018 going into 2019. And we see it again now. So, yeah. Yes, deflation does not spur consumption at all. But what about unemployment? Well, many of you who watch the show on a regular basis know that we love looking at the four-week moving average of initial claims because it tells us when you see long periods of disinflation or outright deflation, what normally is following or going in step with it, well, rising initial claims. So you see that here in the early 80s. We see that in the late 80s going to the early 90s, again in the 2000s of the dot-com bubble, of course, during the GFC. And now we're starting to see it again. And a lot of people don't you know, draw the connection because it's real simple. If people are losing their jobs, they make less money on unemployment. If you have less money at a time when prices have gone up and your debt level, and not to mention your cost to service that debt have gone up, 
guess what you have less money for? And the answer is less discretionary spending. Yep, you got it. And that means the economy and inflation start to come down. The big concern is whether the policy tools that we they have will have much traction in terms of trying to avert deflation or dealing with deflationary pressures once they arrive, here suggesting that perhaps we need more stimulus and more policy support. But keep in mind there's a limit. You cannot keep stimulating economies over and over and over again expecting the same result because one of the problems with all the stimulus is it adds on to the debt level and at some point debt becomes a major headwind. And here we can see from the global economy, extended deflation in China might help cool inflation elsewhere. Well, it will, and it will show you here in the next chart, including the U.S., since its factories make up such a large share of the world's goods. But something that shouldn't be deflating is your trading account. So here's one we haven't looked at, and this is wood. And what I want to show you here, there was this beautiful quadruple bottom pattern. But if you didn't notice it, what I'm going to show you in the CTA reports. And what our model does is it looks at the machine positioning, and then it runs a historical overlay. And it saw this pullback, and it held it and held it and held it and said it triggered way up here. And some of your trains are like, wow, it caught it late. It did catch it late, but low what? It still is worth over a 2% upside trade and could go more. And hey, look, if you're looking for great trades, there's no better product than CTA Timer Pro to add to your arsenal because as many who are subscribers say, this has simplified things and made it easier. Here we can go back to June 26. We see it pull back to this 35% long on our very fast algorithm and then our slower one. And it held it there for almost 20 trading days as we get to July 13th. Team. And this is a little unusual, but the slow one triggered first, saying, look, the machines were buying. And as you can see from the report, as we showed you, that trades up a little over 2%. Not a huge number, but when you're trading, the more positive trades you can put in the bank, the better it is. Link, link in the description below. It's a mere 30 bucks a month. Check it out. I know you'll love it. But let's look at what China here. As we talk about exporting deflation, well, this chart tells us everything. Here we have the consumer price index against the Chinese producer price index. Remember, what comes out of Chinese factories, well, that's deflationary to the rest of the world. And sure enough, what you see in red is that China tends, as the factory sector starts to deflate or disinflate, well, what happens, it transmits right back into U.S. consumer prices without much of a lag. You see it over and over, this beautiful relationship telling us that U.S. consumer prices are likely to continue to fall here here because Chinese producer prices continue to slide. They're actually negative here, telling us that, of course, U.S. consumer product prices are declining in the months to come. And China could escape further deflation if growth remains momentum, if growth regains momentum later this year, helped by government stimulus, as some economists anticipate. And while we may see that, I do want to suggest to you that you overdo stimulus, it stops to have any effect. And that's one of the challenges here. And maybe Chinese policymakers are worried about this. We'll see. But if they get a strong bout of deflation, don't be surprised if they come back and juice the economy. In fact, there's already signs they're getting nervous, they're starting to panic, and they're already making moves. Check this out. China most mortgage easing to spur home buying in big cities. Now, I want you to keep in mind as we go through these headlines and look at what they're doing, some point, stuff this like is going to come to America because right now we're hearing from Jay Powell, inflation's a problem, inflation's a problem. Well, by the end of the year, he could be scratching his head saying, I don't know why we're in deflation, but we are, and we need stimulus to get out of it, and China is going to lead the pack. Regulators are weighing scrapping rules that disqualify people who've ever had a mortgage, even if fully repaid, from being considered a first-time home buyer in major cities, if you can imagine. And why is that a big deal? Well, if you've ever been a first-time home buyer, there's lots of incentives. But the problem is, once you've ever owned a home, you're no longer one. Well, in China, maybe it won't matter. If you pay it off or sold it, you could be a first-time home buyer again. And what we can see is currently home buyers with a mortgage record who don't own a property are still subject to the higher down payment and more restrictive borrowing limits applied to those buying a second home. And if you could scrap that rule, well, a lot of people might be first time home buyers and go out and spend. And there's a good reason they need them to, because look at this, China vows urban redevelopment support to boost construction means put people back to work. 
The government is considering easing home buying restrictions in the nation's biggest cities and wants to refurbish rundown areas. China's housing ministry had called for more redevelopment projects with a focus on building elevators in some apartment complexes. Building anything at this point is all that matters because there's problems in their property sector continue to get worse. I'm going to show you some charts here in a little bit to validate this. But look at this. China's property was shown by a drop in total amount of mortgages telling us people don't want to buy. The outstanding amount of individual mortgages fell to 38.6 trillion yuan at the end of June, down 260 billion yuan from the same period a year earlier. And that's the first year on year drop in data going back to 2011. And this is big problems. And I want you to look at this chart here. We're going to look at some U.S. data because what I want you to understand, and granted, I don't have Chinese charts available, but what I want you to understand is when you see new loans being created, that's new money. But when you see it go negative, where the year-on-year -year rate of change goes down, that means more people are paying down their loans than creating new ones. And in a debt-based economy, that in itself destroys money because principal payments destroy money, not a good sign. And check this out. Here we have the consumer price index in blue. We got some U.S. data here just to look at this against the commercial industrial loans at all commercial banks. That's shown in red. And normally when you get a slowdown, you see the blue line going down. Notice the red line tends to follow either at the same time, right a little before or a little after, because what it's telling you is the economy is slowing. And if you get into a deflationary period, which we do in loans, we've had that happen during the global financial crisis. We had it happen during the dot-com bubble. We had it briefly during the early 90s recession. That means money's being destroyed and you start to get an accelerant effect a downward in consumer prices because you, at this point, you don't have enough money in the system to chase goods and services. That leads to disinflation. The amount of mortgages also fell almost 1% from the end of March, which is only the third time it's recorded a quarter-on-quarter -quarter contraction. And here, just as I said, that indicates people across the country repaid more money that was borrowed in new mortgages in the April-June period, showing the housing market shrinking again after a short-lived rebound. And again, in, once you understand how these global monetary systems work in a debt-based system, you need a constant expansion of new debt. When you have it going the other way, you still start to get into a deflationary environment and it gets really hard to get out of it without it spiraling out of control. As China stops short of direct consumer support to spur economy, which will be the next call coming soon, as the Communist Party's Politburo last week signaled concern about the economy's recovery, with officials pledging more easing of property measures, as we touched on, support for consumption and resolving the debt problems of local governments. On Friday, three government agencies published a raft of measures focused specifically on the so-called light industry, which covers items from home goods, food and paper making to plastic. They've got major problems there because look at this. It's difficult to stimulate the demand side with policies. This is exactly what I've been trying to say, is you can only do so much, but there's a second side to this. Look at this, it's very rare we see that some author, in this case of this article, got it right. Check this out. And here, we, that was the head of research and chief economist for the greater China at Jones Lang LaSalle. But look at this, he says, when residents are generally unwilling to spend, this is regardless of what the government's doing or policies, and the government is unwilling to hand out subsidies to increase the consumption tendency, policymakers can only adjust the supply for consumer goods and services to better meet the demand. And what this means is demand around the world is coming down. We're seeing it start in China. It's happening because demand from the U.S., Europe, and other parts of the world are declining, as we saw. And that means we're not facing a big inflationary push in the future. What we're going to be facing by the end of the year, at least here in the U.S., is how we're going to get away from outright deflation. As I mentioned in the beginning of the show, what's happening in China is coming to the U.S. and not too distant future. And with that, I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being fans. Bye now.